Sorry for the, whoa. Sorry for the, the, it's working. We're waiting on the audio system. I think it works. So, so I'm Jeff Cook. I'm the chairman of the Tennessee Fish and Wildlife Commission. I'd like to welcome you all to our to day number one of our July meeting. Today's our committee day, so the committee members will be discussing the topics and voting, and then tomorrow's our commission meeting with the full commission will discuss and vote. So uh, let's get started with the roll call, please, Net. Bill Cox, Connie King, Kent Woods, James Stroud, Angie Box, Jamie Woodson, Tony Sanders, Bill Swan, Dennis Gardner, Chad Baker, Brian McLaren, Kurt Holbert, Jeff Cook. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you, Danette, and I'd like to welcome a few of our guests. We have uh, John Daniels from the Fur Harvester Association, Mr. Mike Butler from Tennessee Wildlife Federation, Mr. Barker, who's with us again, welcome back, Mr. Crabtree, the same, welcome back, uh, Mr. Leonard Ezell, uh, longtime hunter education instructor, and Mr. Richard Sims, who's a journalist Barry, and guide. did you let them know that I'm on there? Welcome, Jimmy James. Hey, guys. And Mr. Ed Williams is here. So thank you for coming. So as usual, uh, any, during the discussion phase, uh, any of the public would like to speak, please step to the microphone, state your name, where you're from, if you uh, represent any organization. We usually ask for three minutes. We have, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, also have folks from, from uh, Mayor Skip Taylor from Fayette County. Uh, Ryan Hall from the Wolf River Conservancy, uh, Mr. Larry Smith from Memphis, and I'm sorry, I, I think it's Edward Parks. P-A-R-M-J-A. -A Mr. Parham, welcome, thank you. Your writing is like mine, so, uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to exclude y'all. Um, so, uh, just come, just come to the microphone, uh, state your name, who you represent, uh, for the public, we usually ask for, uh, have three minutes to discuss any topic. Uh, Mr. Mayor and, and Mr. Hall, uh, y'all represent many folks, so please, please have as much time as you need. And with that, um, any other announcements from the commission? All right, I'd like to recognize Ken Tarkington. He wants to give us a, a glance back in time, our agency historian. So, been looking forward to this. Will Director Carter be in the first slide? He will. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Thanks, Scott. I was sure it wouldn't come up, but it, it did. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Commission, the uh, director had asked that I uh, give you a brief history on Chattanooga, principally during the Civil War, um, and why it was important to the North, why it was important to the South, too, strategically. And... Um, uh, also, something about the leaders uh, on both sides, on both the North and the, uh, and the South, that converged here at one time uh, in 1863. Now, these um, uh, almost 100,000 people, 100,000 soldiers were here. Very good. All right. Um, usually, it's called the Battles for Chattanooga. Uh, there were two campaigns. One is in, was in Chickamauga. Uh, Chickamauga's, uh, the Indians uh, named it the uh, River or, or Water of Death, not because of the Civil War, but because of smallpox several years earlier. The Chattanooga campaign consisted of two main battles, Missionary Ridge and Lookout Mountain. Why were these so important? The... Um, the main thing was the, the geography. Uh, the, the, where uh, Chattanooga lay uh, at, the, at the base of the mountains, uh, there was a convergence of rail and, um, and water. Uh, Tennessee River. The, the river obviously can float uh, large quantities of goods and uh, material and equipment in mass. Uh, it's somewhat slow. Rail, on the other hand, is some more, some, uh, so much more or so much quicker uh, and more efficient. 
However, prior to the Civil War, uh, all throughout the U.S., um, there were several short-line railroads that, that, would, that had sprung up, but they were different gauges. There was a different dimension or a different width between uh, the left side, uh, left wheel and right wheel. Well, in, in Chattanooga, there were five railheads, and all these railheads had uh, basically five-foot width gauge. So what that meant is when uh, uh, traditionally when you would get to the end of the line, you'd have to offload your passengers or soldiers and your artillery pieces, your horses, your mules, your uh, cannons, um, uh, uh, powder, shot, etc., and then reload it. Well, in Chattanooga, all you had to do was a little bit, uh, not quite as simple, but almost flip a switch, uh, a rail switch, and you could go on your way, and you could go further south. Um, it was a way that the north could get into the deep south and get to the deep south uh, very efficiently. Um, Chattanooga was a manufacturing hub, uh, produced a lot of iron, uh, iron works, uh, which is what the North needed to, uh, uh, to help in their endeavor of the war effort. Also, it was a big depo uh, depository of, of energy, of coal, uh, both to make iron and, um, and other things as well. The main, the overall benefit to the North was it was a, a method to get into the Deep South, to get to uh, Georgia, Atlanta, uh, which would prove very beneficial for William Tecumseh Sherman later in 1864 when he laid siege to uh, uh, Atlanta and then pushed to the sea. Uh, a little bit about the, uh, the men who fought this. Uh, we've got three of them up there. There are many. Uh, uh, many leaders, uh, many errors were made during these battles. Most of you are probably familiar, or more familiar with the gentleman on the left. Uh, that's the 18th President of the United States, which is uh, Ulysses S. Grant. In this particular picture, he's a three-star general uh, taken at Cold Harbor, but during this time, he was a major general. He had been, which is less than a lieutenant, he would, had just been promoted to the, uh, the Army of the West, uh, simply because, the, the Northern Army of the West, simply because of his victory in Vicksburg. Now, Vicksburg occurred uh, earlier in the year, 1863. Um, the, um, it's in the bend of the river, and the naval gunboats, na uh, the Northern naval gunboats, laid siege to the uh, city. The city would not surrender. Uh, it said that they shell the city for 30 days and more than 22,000 shells. Um, there were very few casualties during this period of time because they had built a catacomb of, uh, of caves and underground networks similar to the Viet Cong 100 years later. Uh, they, the city of Vicksburg, surrendered uh, on July 4th, 1863, and it said that they did not celebrate Independence Day for 75 years, uh, although there's been uh, recorded incidents where they did as, as early as 1904, but that's still 40, 41 years later. Anyway, uh, Ulysses Grant graduated from the uh, Naval, uh, excuse me, the uh, Army Military Academy at West Point. The next gentleman is uh, Major General Rosecrans. Uh, he also graduated from West Point. Um, one of his classmates was uh, General William Tecumseh Sherman. Uh, the reason that Grant was, or one of the reasons he was in Chattanooga was to leave that gentleman of his command of, of his efforts at Chickamauga, which I'll mention later. Uh, the one to the right, gentleman to the right, is uh, Major General, later take over uh, during the siege and the battle of, uh, for Chattanooga. Uh, General Thomas, uh, very methodical, a uh, very deliberate man, was accused sometime of being slow to react, uh, but uh, his, his victories would, uh, would show and uh, bail a, uh, a very definite defeat. These two gentlemen are from uh, the Southern generals, uh, General Braxton Bragg on the right, commander of the Army of Tennessee, uh, was, slow, was said to be uh, some, sometimes slow in issuing orders, uh, issued very confusing orders. Um, his generals quarreled about that, quarreled to him. He quarreled back with them. Um, West Point graduate. Um, he, um, he would later 
he would later ask for and, and, and receive the gentleman on the right, Lieutenant General uh, James Longstreet, from uh, a different theater. This is the first time that a, an army was transported from one theater to another. Uh, he was from the Army of Virginia. Uh, he had 14 or 16,000 men under his command. Uh, he was brought to Chattanooga to help increase the mass of the southern forces so they could launch an, an effective uh, assault or, um, or perhaps set up an effective uh, defense. Um, probably one of the, the sharpest uh, and, and, and most successful generals in, in the South. Uh, guess where he went to school? He graduated from West Point. Um, he was the roommate of General Rosecrans. I think this is probably forming a pattern. All these guys not only knew of each other, they knew each other. They knew each other individually. Uh, they learned under the same instructors. And for 20 years before the Civil War, uh, war waging was basically the same. You, 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 uh, you attacked and massed on the frontal, frontal line. So they learned the same subjects, they learned the same techniques, they learned the same tactics, they learned from the same individuals, and they even worked with each other. So they knew each other intimately. Okay, let's go to the battle. Uh, Chattamauga, uh, uh, Chickamauga <coughs> uh, occurred uh, in late uh, September 1863. It had been raining that day, and if any of you have been to Chickamauga, it's, uh, a lot of it looks very similar to the, to the way it did then. Uh, tree, grass, etc. Um, it was misty, it had, it had rained, and after the first volley of shots fired, um, there was a big cloud of smoke and it was hard to see anything. Um, it was hard to see in front, to the side. And General Rosecrans, who was in charge at that time for the federal troops, excuse me, um, perceived that he had a gap in his frontal line. So he issues a, uh, an order to General Thomas Hood to fill that gap. Now, Thomas Hood uh, really questioned this order, but uh, Rosecrans could be kind of hard to deal with, and he didn't want to risk uh, being humiliated and so forth, so he went ahead and accepted the order and obeyed it, and he filled that perceived line. Well, when he did, it created a, a real line, and General Longstreet, uh, pushed through and drove more than a third of the federal soldiers back into the city, into Chattanooga. The only, the only uh, salvation for the, uh, the, uh, the northern troops at that time was a, a defensive perimeter that was set up uh, by General George Thomas. Uh, and he allowed the, uh, uh, the majority of the federal troops to retreat and come into the city where, by the way, the uh, uh, Confederate troops had already set up earlier and had built some defenses. Uh, for this, General Thomas would be known as the Rock of Chickamauga. Uh, along this time, <clears throat> along this time, uh, Bragg is still quarreling with his generals. And um, his generals um, file a petition with then President Jefferson Davis and says, we need to, you need to replace this guy. So Jefferson Davis comes down, and he meets with him. He meets with General Bragg, and he meets with his subordinate generals. And I don't remember how long he, he met, a day or so, and he left. And he really made no decision. I guess the decision was, if I'm not going to say anything, that leaves General Bragg in, in charge. So he leaves, and General Bragg takes it that he's still in charge. So he fires two of his generals immediately. He then reorganizes his command from seven subordinates to two. Um, this adds another layer of, um, or just another layer in between he and his, uh, his generals who he's issuing orders to. And remember, he's already issuing or been accused of issuing very hazy and, and nebulous orders anyway. Um, so this is what's going on with the uh, southern troops during that particular time. He sends, he, Bragg, sends Longstreet back to the east. He's concerned that General Ambrose Burnside, who's in and around Knoxville, will resupply and resupport the federal troops in, uh, uh, in Chattanooga, and he doesn't want this. So he sends Longstreet 
and his 14 or 16,000 men back to the, back to the east. Uh, he's dividing his command. Uh, he's reducing the numbers that, uh, that he has. Well, he's got a, he's got a decision to make. Uh, many of the Monday morning quarterbacks have said, well, he should have gone ahead and pursued it and captured the rest of the uh, uh, federal troops, and it, call it a day, it would have been uh, a victory for the South. And, and Chickamauga was a victory for the South. He didn't do that. So, uh, and he didn't attack. He didn't attack the next day or the next. Um, he wasn't sure where uh, William Sherman, General Sherman's troops were. Um, he didn't know if he had the six to one c uh, capacity he needed to, uh, to assault. Uh, he had said he had gotten somewhat low on shot, powder. Um, so he, he makes a decision to lay siege to the city. He's gonna encircle it. He's gonna starve it out. And, um, and then see what happens. So, uh, as you can see, behind these two gentlemen uh, is Chattanooga from Lookout, uh, Lookout Mountain. And the inset to the right is, uh, is a small photo of uh, Moccasin Bend. And obviously, how it got its name, it looks like a moccasin. Um, so, for uh, many, many weeks until the end of November, uh, he lays siege to, uh, to Chattanooga. And uh, the gentleman on the left is uh, a fellow by the name of uh, Ward Zitz Zitzke. Uh, at the time, he was a U.S. Army uh, major, and he was a historian for the 81st uh, Army Reserve Command, headquartered in Birmingham, Alabama. He's wearing a traditional enlisted uh, uniform, uh, wool pants and shirt, Kempe hat, and a 58 caliber smoothbore percussion muzzle-loading rifle. Now, these rifles were pretty well standard issued for both sides. They could, uh, a person, a uh, soldier could effectively uh, load, aim, and fire approximately three times a minute. During uh, the Battle of Chickamauga in Chattanooga, there were two brigades on the federal government side that had the new Sharps repeating rifles. They were 14 uh, shot cartridge rifles and uh, were much more effective. You could load much quicker. Uh, shoot much faster, and the officers during the same period of time were outfitted with cartridge revolvers. Uh, so the same thing, they could reload much quicker. The gentleman on the right is a fellow by the name of Dr. Lee Hereford. Um, at the time, he was a historian for all of the Army Reserve. He was, uh, uh, at that time, headquartered at Fort McPherson, uh, Georgia. Uh, he has one of several um, uh, federal officer uniforms, uh, cavalry boots, sword, uh, eyepiece or monocular, and as he referred to his dandy hat, uh, complete with a plume. Um, and of course in the back is Chattanooga, and Dr. Hereford is looking at the spot where the federal troops uh, at the end of the Battle of Lookout Mountain implanted their flag. By the way, these are two of the most astute students uh, I've ever come across of the Civil War. Uh, they leave it, live it, breathe it, uh, uh, discuss the strategies and so forth. Uh, if you like that sort of thing, it is, it is absolutely wonderful to uh, get in a conversation with them and listen to, and listen to them. Okay, we're back in Chattanooga, in the city. Federal troops are... Uh, uh, behind emplacements. Uh, General Bragg and the... Uh, uh, southern troops are along the ridge, Missionary Ridge up there. In fact, if you can, <clears throat> if you can envision uh, to the right of that uh, gap is where General Bragg's headquarters is. Uh, his men are on the geographical crest of the hill. And I'll mention that later. Um, even though he's been there for several weeks, they've really not set up many emplacements. Uh, other than rifle pits at the base of, of the ridge. Now to the right, my right, uh, is Lookout Mountain. Uh, he, he commands that area too. So he's starving the, uh, the folks in, in Chattanooga out. And they were down to a ration, a daily, uh, not a daily ration, but a ration of a quarter pound of pork and four biscuits per soldier for every three days. So they massed their troops before they, they uh, engage in all-out battle, they issue what's called a demonstration order. A demonstration order is somewhat of a uh, scouting 
uh, look-see, um, to try to engage the enemy, to see where they are, how much in mass, what their capabilities are, how much artillery, et cetera. And it's really their last point, the commander's last point at this particular time of the nation, of, of, of history, for them to make a major um, change in their battle plan. Remember, there's no cell phones, there's no radios, et cetera. Uh, the, the main form of communication is these men are running up is their guide-on and their guide-on barrier. A guide-on is their unit flag. Uh, as long as that unit flag is flying high in the air, then the soldiers of that unit know where to go, how to, uh, how to proceed. That's why it was so important when a guy on Barry was shot that someone else pick it up and carry it on. So, uh, kind of lays the groundwork for this. So they, they issue a demonstration order. Well, it's misunderstood. And it's all out chaos. It's all out attack. These federal troops are running out and it, it the time I'm speaking about, this is a, a view across the National Cemetery in Chattanooga. Obviously those uh, buildings, many of those trees were not there. It was a little bit flatter uh, or a little bit more open. Um, they're streaming, up, they, they, they overrun the rifle pits very quickly. They're streaming up the hill, the hill, the ridge, the mountain in six points. Now the soldiers from the south, as I said earlier, are on the geographical crest of the hill. The geographical crest is just that. It's where geography says the, 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 the crest of the hill is, and they've got a blind spot in front of them. They cannot see anybody coming up the hill, coming up the ridge, coming up the mountain, until they're right on them. Well, they overrun them. The federal troops overrun them and push them back. Uh, much to the surprise of really everybody involved. Now to the right over here is Lookout Mountain. In comes this guy. Well, he's, he's been there a while, uh, but his name is General Joe Hooker. General Joe Hooker is somewhat fresh uh, from uh, uh, being given credit to the uh, loss at the, at the Battle of Chancellorsville. He's looking for a victory. He wants to regain his rightful place um, and, um, and, 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 and be a hero. Um, he's very capable. Um, by the way, he's a, he's a West Pointer. He was in the same class as General uh, Braxton Bragg. Um, he is uh, known as a ladies' man. He uh, allows drinking and carousing and uh, gambling in his headquarters. Uh, he had a band of uh, ladies that would follow his troops from location to location, and they were known as Hooker's Ladies. And later on, they dropped the ladies, and that's where the, the term Hooker came from. So, so General Hooker is out for, uh, for victory. He's going to get a victory. Um, this is a, uh, a look from the, from the north uh, or northwest to uh, Lookout Mountain. Uh, and you can see the, the inset uh, photograph, and it's a famous painting, and I can't recall who painted it, but it uh, painter, the artist was there during the 1863. And if you noticed, um, there are clouds down from the crest of the hill. And this is known as the, the Battle Above the Clouds. And it really didn't matter that Bragg's men again were on the crest of the hill the geographical crest, and this would be repeated many times later. Um, it, you, you wonder why, but um, even to the point a year later, 1864, Battle of Nashville, uh, General Thomas Wood, who was the one that's, that filled the perceived um, uh, gap at Chickamauga, he would set his headquarters up at Adelicia Ackland's uh, Belmont Mansion in Nashville. Uh, he would uh, perform a flanking movement against the left flank of the, of, of the Confederate soldiers. And he would drive Colonel uh, William Shy uh, on the battle of, uh, at that time, known as Compton Hill from the battle, simply because his men were set up on the geographical crest of the hill. But nevertheless, we're back at Chattanooga, Lookout Mountain. Uh, General Hooker receives this demonstration order, and it said that he misunderstood it. Um, several, yeah, I know, 
I need to shut up. Uh, I'll talk real fast. I'll talk real, real fast. Okay, General Hooker um, says that uh, he, uh, he didn't hear it. Uh, many think he just uh, disallowed it. He swarmed the hill. He drove the soldiers from the, the uh, Confederate soldiers from the right to the left. And when you do that, from the west all the way to the north to the east, what's on the east side of Lookout Mountain? Chattanooga. What's in Chattanooga? Federal troops. What's, what do they have? Artillery pieces. That essentially was the end of, of those battles. Uh, remember, this is a lot of stuff that occurred in, in, in uh, about two and a half months. Okay, it was a decided victory for the north. Uh, it's based on uh, misinterpreted, ignored orders. Um, leadership and... Uh, uh, issues uh, and command control issues on both sides. Um, and it's a major turning point of the year. Now, if you read anything about uh, almost any kind of history, and especially wars, they say, well, it was a turning point. Well, there were several turning points. Nashville was a turning point. Gettysburg was a turning point. Chattanooga. And Chattanooga probably was more strategic than anything else. It allowed the North into the Deep South. Uh, this howitzer is in front of a... a uh, a monument that's up on Missionary Ridge. It uh, was uh, erected sometime in the early 1890s. When the people uh, 20, 25 years after the uh, uh, Civil War uh, began uh, placing monuments where they had fought or their friends had died. Um, an interesting thing about this particular monument, uh, in 1900, the battle site, site director said, well, we found that all these uh, monuments that the states have erected up here are 400 yards too far to the right and they'll have to be moved at state expense. So they were all moved. 1904 comes along, new battle site director, and he says, no, they were right to begin with. You need to move them back. And uh, uh, Minnesota said, no, nah, our, our monument's not on wheels, so it'll stay right where it is. Uh, by the way, Chickamauga and, um, and uh, 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 Chattanooga battle sites were the first uh, military park that were set up by the U.S. Three more men and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be finished, Darren. Uh, but they, I really think these need to be mentioned. Uh, on the left, General Burnside's, Ambrose Burnside, he was the, he was the fellow in, in, in Knoxville. Any of you from further east Tennessee in Knoxville probably are aware of his name. Uh, was one diversionary tactic that pulled General Longstreet off, divided uh, Bragg's. Uh, troops. His men, Ambrose uh, Burnside's men, uh, talked about him a little disparagingly as sometimes enlisted folk do about their commanders and they called him old sideburns uh, because of his facial hair, hence the, the hair in front of the ear below the hairline is now known as sideburns. The other man, uh, next man in the middle, uh, Montgomery Meggs is probably uh, the most underrated general, in my opinion, uh, on either side. Uh, very methodical, sharp, sharp fellow. He was the, had been appointed early in 1861 as the quartermaster general. Um, it was said that of the $3 billion it took for the federal government to prosecute the war, he could account for every red cent of it. He had the uncanny ability uh, and uh, 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 wherewithal to put together plans to produce foodstuffs, clothing, artillery pieces, uh, shot, powder, everything it needed to prosecute the war and logistically get it to the combatant commanders when they needed it. And that was something that was so crucial. Um, graduated from West Point. He was an engineer by trade. Later on in his career, uh, he would build several buildings in D.C. that are still there. He loved to see his name. And if you look in several of them, you'll see them not just on a plaque, but he would put them on the stair treads as they went up the stairs, Megs. Other man, last man on the right, uh, Arthur MacArthur. And this picture is Lieutenant General. At the time of the Battle of Chattanooga, he was uh, a lieutenant, um, Ar uh, Arthur MacArthur. He received the Congressional Medal of Honor for his heroic actions on the uh, Missionary Ridge. He was the commander of the 24th. Uh, uh, Wisconsin, and uh, 80 years later, his son Douglas would also re would receive the Congressional Medal of Honor for his uh, efforts in the Philippines in World War II. Douglas and MacArthur would also be appointed uh, only uh, the fifth number five uh, fifth five star general. Uh, these two gentlemen would be the only father son recipients of the um, Congressional Medal of Honor until about 15 years ago. Um, uh, 
Theodore Roosevelt would receive one posthumously for his uh, Spanish-American War efforts. His son received his during World War II. And that concludes the battles for Chattanooga. Ken, thank you. That was a great presentation. Having grown up in Franklin, I've always been fascinated by the Civil War. And, you know, we forget, I think it's true that most battles, the, that more battles were fought in Tennessee than any other state, right? So, I mean, we're surrounded by history. So, thank you for that reminder. It's very good. Uh, I'd like to recognize Don King for presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to introduce a gentleman uh, that, that is actually bringing uh, uh, kind of a show and tell with us, uh, for us today, Mr. John Daniels. And uh, John, if you could come on up and, and just tell us a little bit about, about what you have for us today and, and how it came about. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Don. Um, I'm the past president of the Tennessee Fur Harvesters Association. Uh, our association is the largest trapping organization in the state of Tennessee. And we, our main goal as an association is to promote trapping across the state, educate the public on the fact that sound fur bear management is a part of overall wildlife management and that trapping is one of the best tools to help manage those animals. Um, I happened to be at the Region 3 office a couple of years back and overheard a conversation between a couple of the people that work up there about uh, skull collections that were going out to uh, a, a school that past week and how that, uh, the collection they had was kind of starting to get a little ragged and the need for more skull collections. And uh, I'm always, uh, was always looking at ways that uh, we could partner with the TWRA. And one of our goals had been to have a promotional ad for our association in our hunting and trapping guide. Uh, hearing the cost that they were paying for, for their skull collections, I thought, you know, this might be a good opportunity for us to partner here and further education about trapping and about fur bears. And I contacted uh, Mr. King here and we struck a deal. And, I uh, talked with uh, Director Carter a little bit, and last year we got it in our uh, hunting and trapping guide. And uh, today we brought uh, our collection here as a part uh, as to hold up to our end of the bargain. Uh, we, we really appreciate our opportunity to work with the TWRA and this commission. Um, I'm also a vice president of the National Trappers Association, and I have the opportunity to be a part of and witness other wildlife agencies across the nation. And I, I'm glad to always report and talk about our, our TWRA. I'm very proud of what the TWRA in Tennessee has done. Uh, our, our Wildlife Resources Agency is right up there at the tops of all of them throughout the nation. And uh, we love the fact that you guys are doing such a great job, you have such a diverse job because of the diversity of wildlife here in the state, and you guys are doing an excellent job with what you do. We're very proud of you and love being a part of what you're doing. Thank you for our opportunity to work with you on this project. I'd like to present this to TWRA at this time. Mr. Daniels, thanks for all you do for us as well as nationally, and it's a great gift. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, if you wouldn't mind joining us for a photo of, of this, we would appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, John, for all your efforts. These will amaze many over their time here.
any more announcements from the any issues from the commission or director carter i'd like to recognize chairman holbert for the wildlife committee meeting thank you mr chairman my home um first off i'd like to welcome you all today um if you look at the agenda we're going to go a little bit out of order uh we've had some some people travel from a pretty far distance today uh, to make some comments so i'm going to give them an opportunity to do that um, at the beginning of the wildlife committee wildlife management committee um, so at this time i'm going to ask if anybody here would like to make a public comment on wolf river wma if you would uh state your name and who you represent when you come when you come on up mayor even though i know who you are but that way it's on record gentlemen uh, chairman thank you all very much for the opportunity to speak to y'all today the purpose of my time today is to request your reconsideration of the change allowing a center fired rifle deer season at the wolf river wma about six weeks ago, I was informed of the change by residents and hunters in the area. During the same time, the town of LaGrange was also considering a resolution, which LaGrange is in Fayette County also, about the process and was passing a resolution against the change. In Fayette County, our county commission works on a system very much like yours. They go through a committee system. During that process, our commissioners heard many details and discussions about the process. They tasked me with the, um, to find out more information. And in doing so, I talked to many hunters in the area, hunters outside of the area, about their, about their concerns and whether it was a good thing or bad. I can tell you that the responses I got were most entirely negative. I had inquiries about the management. I tried to find out about how it's handled. Apparently, WMAs are handled a little bit differently, small game to large game. Small game, you have the burn, you take care of it for the quail and rabbit, whereas deer is more of a center fire, and the two don't operate quite the same. The hunters, for the folks I've talked with, were concerned. The small game, of course, with dogs, and rabbits, and the quail and whatnot, tend to run deer off, and the folks who, run, who hunt deer, of course, that just you know, doesn't produce quality hunt. There was concerns about that from both sides. And you don't get a good deer hunt when you have that going on and you run off the small game. Small game hunter, excuse me. What I'm trying to do is go through my notes, make sure I take care of your time. I understand. Yes, sir. This, let me go through this next one. The hunters I talked with were concerned about the, dis the different types of hunts. While adding very little to a quality deer hunt, people and dogs tend to distract deer. And since this is only WMA in West Tennessee that's treated very much like this, there was concerns that people who came to that area, who traditionally came down there to hunt this, would be discouraged from coming. Also, there was, there was another 4,000 acres in the area very close to it that it was already set up like you decided to do it. As y'all talked about it in your last meeting, I believe it was a concession was made to limit the size of the hunt to a shorter period of time, acknowledgement that there was some concerns about how the two operated, since you had burning processes during the, to take care of the small game. I passed on my information to the commission after a somewhat lengthy discussion they passed a unanimous resolution that I think you have in front of you. In my inquiry, several groups, both hunting and conservation-minded groups, expressed their concerns and disapproval of the change. I'm sure you have correspondence from them, and I'll let that correspondence stand for itself. I'm here today representing not only my Fayette County commissioners, but also the hunters and residents in that area who cannot be here today. I have consulted with their legislators and I've expressed our opinions to them and I think y'all may have talked to them in some form. Talked at length with Senator Gresham in our area and she concurs and she backs the local opposition totally. In fact, she had a comment that said no one understands the impacts the change would bring to the community better than people living there. What I would like for you to do is reconsider your change. 
so that you would vote on it again. Consider the, the request from the folks in the area, the hunters in the area, and the, how this would affect that WMA specifically. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor Taylor. Next. So I'm Ryan Hall with Wolf River Conservancy, um, Director of Land Conservation. Um, I'm here both represent, I'm not elected, but I'm here uh, representing our members, donors, and also as a co-manager of that portion of the wildlife management area. Um, you guys may not know when it, when the Beasley Plantation was protected, uh, Wolf River Conservancy helped raise a million dollars to go towards that protection. Uh, and then as a result, we are one of the co-managers along with TDEC, TWRA, Wolf River Conservancy for this area. Um, our, our big concern uh, is the diversity of users. Uh, the mayor just spoke on that as well. Uh, you've got so many small game uh, hunters already. And actually the small game hunters really thrive, especially the, uh, the, the uh, dog training in, because the National Bird Dog Competition, as you guys may know, is right there in Fayette County. And uh, one of the reasons these small game work so well is because this is a priority area for quail habitat. So they receive funds, TWRA does, to manage for quail, which yields very good uh, small game for the hunters. Um, you start to put in center fire, center fire rifle, and then you're, you're threatening a good thing that's going because you're all those funds are coming in for those for that small game um, and like like uh, mayor taylor said uh, the two tend to not um, work well together uh, forgive me i've been in a car all day so i'm a little dry uh, and one oh so as co-manager, you know, we have a great relationship right now with TWRA. We've helped uh, add thousands of acres to the Wolf River Wildlife Management Area. We'd like to continue to, you know, we have in good faith that TWRA will do the right thing. This kind of raises some questions because we're trying to protect land for the most diversity of users as possible. Um, and some, something like this seems to possibly threaten that. Uh, and then I also wanted to speak on, this will be the last thing, um, something that was said in the previous meeting saying that access uh, to the unit that does allow rifle hunting was pretty restrictive. Um, and that's, that's just simply not the case. You actually have road frontage in a lot of areas. So for it, I can just literally state it here. Uh, I can I'm really good with facts. So. Uh, Hayes Road, you got 725 acres that you can easily access as a parking area, walk right in. Johnson Road, uh, we helped TWRA just add on 750 acres. These are all open to all seasons. Um, McKinstry Road and Watermill Street, 173 acres. Highway 96, uh, 196, 900 acres. That's on the west side, about 112 acres on the east side. Fletcher Drive, there's a paved access. You go park at the end of the cul-de-sac, walk right in, 333 acres right there. Carville Arlington Road, there's a little pull-off. Park, walk right in, 374 acres. Um, Wolf River Conservancy appreciates the diversity across these two units of the WMA. The rifles have their place, and we continue to add to that acreage. So we purchase and sell, negotiate prices down so that TWRA can get these lands at a lower cost, uh, plus the land is conserved, um, and we do that on both units. So I do recommend that the commission uh, revisit this subject. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Uh, my name's Larry Smith. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee. Um, I'm going to say, first of all, thank you very much for the courtesy of letting us go. I know this is a little out of the ordinary. Um, it is an honor and a privilege to talk to you guys today and have the opportunity to, to express an opinion about this. Uh, 
in short what they said, but I, I speak for myself and only myself. I'm a deer hunter. I don't bow hunt and never have. Uh, nothing against that. I just I like to gun hunt. I hunt for deer. I don't hunt for horns. I like venison and I kill deer. I've never hunted on Unit 1. I've only hunted on Unit 2, and I've hunted on every one of the tracks that's available and a few new ones that have come on board. Uh, I like it. It's uh, fine. Uh, it's, again, it's, uh, you can realize those sites are open to season-wide limits and whatever use they are, and, it, and it's been fine. But again, access has not been any issue at all. Um, and again, just it's wonderful being able to sleep in your own bed, not have to camp out and go hunt in the morning and come home, you know, by 10, 30, 11 o'clock with my deer, and, and we butcher it in the backyard after we've reported it to you guys. Uh, it's just been a wonderful trip. I've been with the Conservancy in, the, in my past lives. Uh, not anymore, but I'm certainly a big fan of theirs, and I've had, the, again, the privilege and honor of working with you guys in the past and working with many of these landowners in the past whose land has now come into public ownership, and it's just wonderful to see that in Unit 2. Um, again, it's just, uh, I urge you to please reconsider your decision from the last meeting to put, and please put those regulations back to the way they were and have been working fine for the last 20 years. So thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Edward Parham. I'm from LaGrange, and y'all, please bear with me. I'm not much of a public speaker. Uh, approximately 20 years ago, when y'all formed this WMA, there was a meeting held in LaGrange, LaGrange School. All people were in that area were there. The TWRE representatives were there. They told us at that very time that this was going to be a premier archery small game area, upland game. That's what we were told 20 years ago. It's worked fine like that for the last 20 years. We have a great working relationship. This place is a real jewel. And the biggest thing about it is the diversity. There's not just bow hunters. There's not just rabbit hunters. This place is used year-round by many, many different facets. I mean, there's canoeings, there's boardwalk, there's children that go out there, there's dog trainers, there's squirrel hunting, rabbit, there's everything there is. And now we already have the rifle hunting on these other 4,000 acres. This place is a jewel the way it is, and it's the only one in West Tennessee where you can go and do all these type of activities and not worry about getting shot. So all of us, all the hunters that I know that I've talked to in my area, in Fed County, the general area, all the people in that vicinity, including all the townspeople of LaGrange, they please, they beg y'all to please leave this the way it is. It works fine. We have a great working relationship and we have for the last 20 years. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Porn. Any other comments on, on Wolf River? Members of the public. Mr. Chairman, you got anything you want to say? Yeah, I'm, I'd like to give, I'd like to respond in that, um, just to give you our perspective on this, uh, we didn't just do this, you know, willy-nilly. Our, our mission is first to preserve and protect the wildlife, and then secondly is to provide opportunity to hunters. And so what we feel like we're doing here is we're being inclusive. As Mr. Hall mentioned, this is a multi-use, very diverse uh, piece of property. And we're looking just to have more diversity. So we're excluding gun hunters, center fire hunters, and actually they're the folks who are helping us to pay for it and manage it. They're buying their licenses. And so we're, we're excluding folks who are helping to pay for it. So we've, we try not to do that. We try to make it as inclusive and give as much opportunity as we possibly can. And, and understand there's all these other things going on there. It's five weeks of the year that the folks will be center fire hunting and the rest of the year and it will be as it has been and now we're not keeping anyone from using it we're just allowing more people to use it so that's our perspective and just wanted to make sure you want to hear that out it could be we're wrong it could be that folks don't use it it, it could be that it's going to be a conflict maybe it's not and we can you know we can always revisit this and vote uh, in, in another time, we can, and in two years anyway, every WMA is discussed again every two years, and the majority of this commission will still be here in two years. So they've heard your concerns, and thank you for coming and expressing those. Thank you. All right, I'm going to move on. Um, I wish I'd ask Greg how to say his last name. Everybody else knows it but me. But Greg Wathen. Man, I'm good. He's going to come up and make a presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to give you an update on a uh, draft chronic waste and disease response plan that the agency has been working on. Back in, I guess it was March of this year, the director asked if um, 
if I would consider taking on uh, responsibility of, of updating our response plan for CWD and getting it up to speed and, and uh, not only doing that, but also look at how do we operationalize it in terms of making it a full-fledged response plan. So I want to kind of give you an update on what we've been doing since March, where we are with that, and where we think we're going to be going uh, with that process. Okay, so back in 2016, Chuck Yost wrote, wrote our first response plan for CWD. It uh, really provided a very strong foundation for the current plan that we have right now. So it was a good starting place for me. I wasn't starting from scratch in terms of working on this. Uh, never was really fully operationalized. Um, fortunately, we have not had a detection of CWD in the states. So we never really had to worry about response from that perspective. But uh, one, of the, one of the things I've been wanting to do and the director has asked me to do is to really think about operationalizing this plan. If we get CWD in Tennessee, how would we respond to that kind of thing and what, what would be needed? And I know that you all have had a number of discussions about chronic waste and disease over the last two years. Uh, you've done a lot of things in terms of budgets and, and uh, procuring uh, equipment and materials and supplies and all that kind of thing. So I think you're in a good place, and you've done some things regulatory-wise that also make us put us in a good place as well. So, so a lot of good stuff that's happened uh, since 2016. Uh, 2018, this draft plan right now incorporates really new information that's come about since 2016. There's been a lot of new stuff that's happened. Um, it incorporates a new risk assess assessment and surveillance plan uh, that we're working on and should have uh, have finalized uh, here in the next uh, month or so, something like that, hopefully by, definitely by September. Uh, it updates our CWD response teams uh, with uh, uh, thinking about who the individuals might be and whether or not we've got some holes there. And then also we've been looking at and thinking about how do we include a more comprehensive communication strategy. Uh, I've had a number of conversations with um, uh, some of our adjacent states that have CWD already and, and asking them, you know, what do you deal with when you have a, a CWD uh, incident in your state? And one of the things that always comes up is the importance of a good communication strategy in terms of uh, communicating within your agency, with other agencies that are going to be involved, and also with the general public. And so it's a, it's a really important aspect uh, that we need to be working on for this plan. Just kind of give you a, a kind of the snapshot of where the current known distribution of chronic waste and disease is now. I believe it's up to 25 states. I haven't counted lately. Uh, the newest occurrence occurred back in February in Mississippi, in the Delta, of Mississippi. And I talked to both the states of Mississippi and Louisiana uh, in the last week or so and asking, you know, how did you respond to this? What were the things you ran into? What were some of the issues you you had with that, and it was, it was quite interesting discussions. Uh, the fact that it was right on the Mississippi River and the Delta, uh, was during a flooded season, uh, was created some issues for Mississippi. Uh, because it was on the border of Louisiana, they had to take in, they had to, to uh, uh, kick into gear in terms of their surveillance and sampling, and, and, and that kind of uh, caused some issues with their state as well. And then lastly, this deer that was picked up positive <coughs> was, uh, actually found by hunters. It had been a, a deer that was starting to act strangely. Uh, they watched it for a couple of days and, um, and then it expired on them. And so they, because they had a walk-in cooler, uh, they were able to, to get it, take it, put it in their cooler, and they called the state. And the state was doing a necropsy and part of that necropsy process was doing a, a, a test for CWD and it came back positive. And I've talked to Mississippi, their chief of wildlife, uh, last week, and he indicates they're not really sure how this positive came up there. They've done um, something like 500 samples in Mississippi within a five mile radius of that, of that area since then. Picked up no additional positives. State of Louisiana's picked up 300 samples. They've not picked up any additional positive either. So it's sort of a mystery as to where that one positive came from and what the, what, um, you know, what the circumstances are there. So they're going to continue their enhanced sampling <clears throat> over the next two to three years to see if they can pick up any more positives and maybe determine where that deer might have come from. 
Um, some speculation on the part of, uh, of the Mississippi chief that that deer may have traveled into that area from a hot spot that they don't know about yet. So that's one, one idea that might have happened there. But these, we've got one, two, we've got four states around Tennessee that already have identified CWD. You have got Mississippi, Arkansas, and Missouri, and Virginia. Fortunately, all of them, all the areas where it has been identified are fairly a good distance away from our borders. And so we've not had to really think about, are we going to implement some kind of uh, a monitoring program in an area uh, where we might have some issues there? So we haven't gotten into that stage, but we have to be prepared to do that if, if that does occur. And, and it is starting to get a little bit closer, especially in Missouri. And so we have some concerns about the spread of the disease from some, some adjacent states. So thinking about the response plan, we've got four primary goals here. One is prevention, preventing the disease from getting uh, introduced into Tennessee. Uh, early detection uh, or a surveillance or sampling program to really try to detect it uh, as early as possible if it does become introduced. A containment goal, once we, if we do have a positive, then we would shift into a containment goal of trying to contain the disease minimize its distribution, determine where it is, what its prevalence is, those kinds of things. And then lastly, uh, I think really important is the communications goal that really kind of goes throughout the entire plan from right now all the way through uh, uh, the containment, uh, containment uh, series of things that we might be doing. So communications being a really important area uh, throughout the process. Thinking about prevention, uh, I think this is one of the areas I think the agency's really shined. Um, we've done some really good things. We've had some, unfortunately, we've had laws on the books that have really, I think, minimized the, the possibility of, of CWD being introduced into Tennessee. The fact that, that we don't have uh, uh, white-tailed deer farms in the state and, and therefore there's, there's a, a you know, prohibition on, on introduction or import of white-tailed deer into the state. That's been on the books for a long, long time, and that's really been to our favor there. So we have legislation there. We also, as you know, just um, uh, updated our prohibition on the transport of deer and elk carcasses or parts from any area outside of Tennessee. And then we have the prohibition on the use and possession of uh, natural urine for uh, cervid urine for uh, hunting purposes. And that will uh, be implemented or starting in March of 2019, uh, next year. On the other side, <clears throat> the other the agency in the state that's really important in this process is the Department of Agriculture. And they do, they do um, uh, manage, they have jurisdiction over all cervids uh, except for white-tailed deer and for wild elk. Uh, they allow the importation of those cervids other, other than those two, two uh, species. And one of the things they have had on the books for a number of years is a rule that, that requires that any cervid that is susceptible to CWD uh, that comes in from outside of the state be part of a herd certification program as, uh, as uh, defined by the USDA. Uh, so USDA has a CWD program standards and the Department of Agriculture has an MOU with USDA that says they are in compliance uh, with, uh, with, that, with those program standards in terms of uh, service being brought into the state uh, from somewhere else. There are currently uh, seven facilities in the state of Tennessee that are part of that herd certification program. So they're the only seven facilities that would be uh, bringing in uh, animals from outside the state that might be susceptible to CWD. So I think we're in pretty good shape on prevention. We've done uh, all we can do. This commission is to be congratulated for the work that you all have done to, to strengthen those uh, regulations and rules. Early detection is an area that uh, we've been looking at strengthening in the last year or so. We've contracted with uh, 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 Cornell University, Kristen Schuler, who is working on a, a um, enhanced enhanced sampling and surveillance plan, which would look at, uh, look at a, a way to, to improve the odds of picking up a positive if, it's, if it occurs in Tennessee. So looking at 
say those uh, those seven facilities that are bringing in service from outside the states, they would be kind of key areas to look at or, or uh, other sampling methodologies. So she is working on that report, finalizing it. Uh, it should be available, uh, uh, I think, this month, next month, I'm not sure. James, you're, you've been working on that kind of thing. And then we're planning on having her come to this commission in September to give you an update and a, and a presentation on that report. So the AC is uh, planning to implement that enhanced uh, surveillance plan uh, this coming fall. And when the hunting season starts, looking at how do, we, how do we increase our sampling and increase our sampling in areas where we think we have the best chances of picking up a positive if, if it's in, in Tennessee. Uh, so in September, we'll have a presentation on that. So that's something new. I think that's something important and really to be, have the best opportunities for us to contain and minimize the disease if it gets if introduced into Tennessee, we need to have an early detection program in place to, to accomplish that. So that's new and, and important, uh, important strategy. The real importance, I think, of this response plan is if we do get a positive. And, and, uh, and that's when things really change for the agency, okay? We, we shift from, from prevention and early detection to containment. We want to know where the disease is. We want to know what the prevalence rate is. We want to minimize the distribution. We want to put into place whatever we can do to make sure that that distribution of the disease stays as small as, as possible in terms of the area there. So that kind of shifts into more of a monitoring program in the area where we have the positive, trying to figure out if we, if we do enough sampling in that area to, to determine what the prevalence rate is. Like Mississippi this past year, implemented a monitoring strategy after they got that first positive and they only picked up that one positive. They haven't picked up any, uh, any more positives since then. So that's what we would be kind of planning to do is really looking at monitoring, increasing the monitoring in that area where we pick up a positive and also thinking about what kind of management actions do we need to implement? Are there new regulations that we need to put, put into place in that area if we get a positive? And then lastly, we want to really determine if we can, the origin of where that animal may have come from. If it's in a captive facility or if it's a wild deer, those kinds of things, and trying to trace back where it might have originated from. So we have management actions, monitoring, and regulatory options there that we're thinking about in terms of containment. From management actions, there's there's really three areas we need to look at. We need to look at wild cervids. If we pick up a positive from a deer that's, uh, that a hunter harvested, that thing, uh, we, would, uh, uh, we would implement certain uh, uh, options there in terms of uh, where that animal came from. We would, we would look at establishing a, what we're calling right now, a CWD containment area, an enhanced sampling area. Um, we would activate our response teams that we have in place. We, consider, we would consider additional regulatory actions and we would initiate an enhanced sampling or monitoring program in that area. For a captive survey, then that shifts the responsibilities uh, to the Department of Agriculture mostly and USDA. So we would be working with them to secure that captive facility uh, from uh, potential escapes we would pursue a quarantine for that and also consider depopulation of the facility. And then we would also do the same management actions as, as for the wild surface in terms of enhanced monitoring around the area there. Now, I, we've met a couple of times with uh, the Department of Agriculture in the last uh, couple of weeks asking them what their response plan is for CWD and they are working on that. And I'll give you a little bit more of an update here later on kind of on those, those conversations, discussions there. But they're starting to look at it pretty seriously. Okay, well, if we do get a CWD positive on a, on a captive facility, what is our response plan? What should we be doing as an agency? That's good. We're making progress, I think, to do that. The last situation is really if we get an adjacent state that has CWD within a 25 mile uh, bound, uh, border of our border. 25 miles of our border is kind of the, kind of the, uh, the dividing line that we're looking at right now. 
if we get that similar to what Louisiana had to deal with this past uh, this past spring, then we would look at implementing or establishing that CW, CWD containment and enhanced sampling area around that 25 mile, where 20, wherever 25 miles is from that positive if it's an adjacent state. And then I implement the same management actions as the wild servants there. So those are sort of the a summary of the management actions. This is sort of uh, what a, a containment and enhanced sampling area might look like there. You've got three circles. I uh, just picked a spot in Humphreys County close to an area where I hunt, uh, my lease there. So that the uh, inner circle there is the five mile uh, core zone. That would be our core zone where we really uh, uh, really have our enhanced monitoring, really focus on the monitoring within that five mile area. Uh, the second circle there, the uh, reddish one is uh, is a 10 mile high risk zone. Uh, and we would be doing a fair amount of monitoring there as well. And then the large blue circle there is the 25 mile um, 25 mile buffer zone. So most of the other states that have CWD response plans have these exact same uh, uh, zones that they've identified in terms of their response. Kind of gives you an idea of where do you focus your efforts and where do you where do you put in your manpower there. And then all the gray counties there. There's eight counties there that are that are in gray. Uh, that's those are the counties that are impacted by that buffer buffer zone. So when we're thinking about regulatory actions, things like that, a lot of those counties might get impacted as well, just because of the way we're setting up our, our, our regulations and, and uh, actions there. Probably can't read this very well, but we do have response teams that are identified. Uh, I can't even read it on my screen, but this is uh, the response team is, is mainly, these are the folks in the agency that would be responsible for going out and doing the sampling, uh, um, uh, coordinating that kind of thing. On the right hand there, there's a, uh, there's a disease, chronic waste and disease media team, which would include the uh, state veterinarian. We've got a state veterinarian, that's a wildlife veterinarian that's coming on in, in uh, August 1st, starting here for the agency and for the uh, UT extension. Uh, communications manager from TWRA and several other of our INE folks as well there. So apologize for the lack not being able to see see these uh, these uh, names and, and individuals there. And the other response team that's really important in this is what we're calling the administrative team, and it includes some of the upper level uh, folks, so the assistant director of operations for the AGC. Uh, the chiefs of information education, wildlife, uh, information technology, and so forth and so on. So a lot of upper level administrative folks would be involved in kind of regular communications and in, in dealing with keeping up with what's going on with, with the response plan there. Okay. Um, one of the, I'll call it a hole in the plan right now is if we do get a positive in terms of the monitoring, we don't really have a monitoring strategy built into this plan yet. And so it's something that we need to do. Uh, I don't think it, it's not going to be hard to, to put that together because there are already a lot of states that are, that are dealing with this. And then there are some pretty good protocols and standards for how you would do that. So it's not really clearly addressed in this response plan. But, and ideally, it would be included in the risk assessment and, and surveillance plan, but I don't know that it's going to be. So if it's not, then what we would do is develop our own monitoring plan and make sure that it's meeting uh, the BMPs that the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies just put out uh, a, a couple of months ago for monitoring CWD. So like I said, I don't think it's going to be difficult to do that, but it is sort of a hole in our plan right now, so it's something that we plan to have in there. And some of the potential regulatory actions that we're talking about in terms of CWD positive, uh, it would be a ban on feeding and rehabilitating wild service in the, in the defined uh, CWD area, a ban on removal of cervid carcasses and parts from that area, uh, mandatory, potentially mandatory sampling of hunter harvested deer and elk from within that CWD area, Maybe increased deer bag limits, extended deer seasons, or additional weapon types. Uh, TWRA, TWRA sanctioned culling actions. Uh, uh, part of the monitoring that Mississippi and Louisiana put into place was 
going out and working with private landowners to go in and, and, and shoot deer to do sampling and also some culling in those areas to get that sample there. And then also potentially mandating disposal requirements for hunter kill service taken in that area. So these are all potential things we would look at. We don't know what we would recommend to the commission when we get to that point, but it's something to look at. Um, one thing that we have not done yet for this plan is we've not written any of these draft regulations, so it's something that we plan to do just to have them in our pocket if we need them. When you're, if we get a positive, then you're gonna wanna move fast. You're gonna wanna pass emergency regulations, things like that, we, but we wanna be ready to go if that happens kind of thing. So that'll be something we'll be doing over here in the next couple of months. Communications, um, the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies put out a draft uh, BMP for chronic waste and disease management. And they recommend that agencies develop a comprehensive communication strategy to address CWD during all phases of the response plan. So that's pretty much pre-detection, uh, which are things we're doing already right now in terms of your website, social media, uh, PSAs on local TV stations, information in your hunting guide, and information for hunting in states with CWD. I saw a uh, a Twitter post this morning from the AGC that talked about the new regulations for carcass transport that came out. And so we're already starting to put some of that stuff together in terms of getting that out, that information out. Post detection, communications changes a, a whole lot. And, um, excuse me, the states that I talked to in the last few weeks talked about how much work and is really needed in the communication side of things uh, once you get a CWD positive. All of a sudden, the media requests skyrocket, uh, general public requests skyrocket, so you really have to be ready to, to roll with your media uh, uh, outreach if you get a positive. What's going on? Uh, what's the status? Uh, the Louisiana, I think they had a pretty good strategy this, uh, this year. They had weekly weekly reports on what they're doing, their sampling efforts, whether or not they've gotten any positives, where they're doing their work, that kind of thing. So we really need to think through what we're gonna do uh, post-detection. Once we get a detection of a positive, how would we approach the communications aspects of this? And this is both, um, you know, there's, there's notifications that have to go out and we've got notification sequences built into the plan in terms of who we, we talk to and who we would tell once we have a preliminary positive or positive. Uh, but there's also internal communications within the agency, how the is communicating across divisions, across regions, that kind of thing. And then there's external communications with, the, with other state and federal agencies and general public. So all these things have to be thought about and built into a, a comprehensive communication strategy. And we do not have that yet in this plan, it's something we need to work on there. So the notifications I've talked about, if we get a preliminary positive, um, uh, we've got a sequence of folks that need to know within the HC, uh, if we, hey, we picked up a preliminary positive, we're gonna get it retested to make sure it's a positive. And then if there's a confirmed positive, then we, then we really reach out to a lot of other organizations and agencies outside of, of our agency that need to know governor's office, uh, other uh, state agencies, federal agencies, and so forth and so on. So quite a, quite a uh, list of uh, folks that need to, need to know on the confirmed positive there. So next steps, uh, we are in the process of review right now, both internally in the agency and also starting to do an external review. We've sent this over to the Department of Agriculture. I mentioned earlier that um, We've had a couple of meetings with the Department of Agriculture in the last couple of weeks. Uh, one thing that they recommended that we do and we agreed to and we're moving forward with is to do what they call a tabletop exercise, uh, which is sort of a mock CWD positive. If we get something somewhere, we may look at those three different scenarios that I told you about earlier, but just kind of go through the plan and, and work it out and make sure that where are the holes in this? What did we not think about that we need to think about? And uh, Department of Agriculture uh, 
Uh, the state veterinarian, they do this pretty routinely for a lot of diseases that they work with. They did one last year with uh, avian influenza, and they feel really, uh, really uh, uh, highly on this kind of exercise that it really helps your plan, it helps you think about the plan and what you might not be thinking about that you need to be thinking about, and you're better prepared to implement once, uh, once something happens there. So we're moving forward with that. We're looking to have a tabletop exercise probably uh, in uh, October or early November of this year. Uh, we've got a consultant that they have, um, uh, uh, we met the other day, Chuck Yost and I met with the other day, along with uh, Charlie Hatcher, a state veterinarian. And it's done this uh, before for them, and so we're gonna probably work with him to, to set up this tabletop exercise. Um, the risk assessment and surveillance plan is going to be completed here soon. As I mentioned earlier, um, uh, Kristen Schuler will be down here in September, or be in Knoxville in September to give you all a presentation on that. Uh, uh, also, our state wildlife veterinarian will be on board by then, and she'll have an opportunity to meet with him as well. And then lastly, potential emergency regulations need to be drafted, and we'll be working on those in the next, uh, next few weeks to a couple of months and have those ready to go as well. Um, one thing I did not put into this presentation was an idea of costs. What's it cost to do a response plan? It was a question I had in my mind, and so I've been asking all the states this, and it kind of runs the gamut, but um, Missouri, a CWD positive cost causes a couple of things. It causes uh, uh, your financial cost to go up um, in terms of dealing with it but also the manpower that's required to deal with that disease is pretty substantial. And so uh, Missouri, they basically, uh, they have what they call a mandatory uh, uh, check station rule for a weekend every gun season where the hunters are required to bring their deer in to have it checked and the sample taken. And they put practically all of their personnel uh, up for that weekend to do that kind of thing. 800 to 1,000 folks is what, they're, what they've been doing with. Uh, they're spending about $800,000 a year on CWD response right now. Uh, Arkansas is not quite as uh, extensive. They've, um, they have about 250 uh, agency personnel that are involved in CWD response on an annual basis. They're spending about $800,000 as well, although they're doing some research with that kind of money. And then uh, Mississippi and Louisiana, kind of the newbies on the block here. Uh, they, Louisiana actually had a pretty efficient operation. They, they didn't spend probably any more than about 25,000 bucks on their response this past, um, this past uh, spring. And they had a fairly localized area that, that they were working in. So they were pretty efficient in terms of getting teams out there and things like that. And I don't have that information from Mississippi yet. Uh, but anyway, you know, the costs are gonna be be pretty significant. Uh, it's gonna change uh, people's lives in the agency for a while to deal with this if we get a positive in terms of what we work on, things like that. So, so we wanna make the, sure that the agency personnel are, are aware, of that, aware of that as well. I think that's it. I'm glad to uh, answer any questions if you have any and, um, and we'll be back with you in September on more of this, so. Thank you, Greg. Questions? Commissioner Cox? Yeah, Greg, uh, thank you for that presentation. I'm, uh, I, I'm a little concerned that we had this presentation that Doug, at, uh, uh, Mr. Yost. Chuck. Chuck, sorry. Yeah. Hadn't seen him in a while, I forgot his name. <laughs> um, Chuck gave us, and, it, and, and I know you guys are busy, but it doesn't seem that a lot of progress has been made since he presented that some time ago and i wonder if if this is needs to be uh done a little more quickly than november december i mean we're fixing to go through another season and what happens if we have one turned in uh opening weekend of rifle season we're not ready and this seems to be something that's really important. I know you've got other things going on and all, but it seems like this might be a little higher priority than some of the other things. Just in, we don't want to get caught and not be ready. So I'm, I'm not trying to be uh, too hard on you, but I, I just think I'm concerned that this is not as 
not any further along with a with a completion than it is. I think we're going to be ready. I think we are ready. Um, and so, you know, one of the things one of the things is you, you can you can speculate all these different scenarios of how it might come about. But having a plan, we already have a plan, and this is just being updated, right? And then we're looking to operationalize it in the in the way of our enhanced sampling, so that we have an early detection. Uh, I think the things where we're not quite ready for is maybe that communication strategy a little bit, getting that ready, and then also having a monitoring plan in place if we do get a positive. And but I don't think it's going to take a long time to get that pulled together. How would you do that? Would you establish or reestablish check stations or or require hunters in that radius to to check their deer in physically with an officer at certain places? It's, it's Is that possible. Kind of how it would look like? We don't know exactly what that's going to look like. We'll have a we'll have a sampling number that we'll we'll need to get based on whatever the population estimate is in that area. We'll have a number of animals that we need to sample, and then we'll figure out uh, the best way to do that. Now, Mississippi and Louisiana, they picked it up in February. It was at the end of their hunting season, and therefore they had to go out and go on landowners' lands in order to get those samples. And so that would be an option for us to do. Um, but if it's during the hunting season, then we can look at some other options. So we'll have a we'll have a suite of different options that we can implement in order to get those samples. But the important part is getting the samples in that target area so that we can have a confidence on what the prevalence of the disease is in that area. Yeah, I want to be wrapped up with the response plan in September by the September commission meeting, which is two months away and then ready to do the tabletop exercise in October, November, which would be right before our main hunting season starts. So I think we'll be ready by then. All right. Chairman. So Greg, on the Mississippi deer, do you know how close the closest uh, captive herd is to that deer? I do not know that. I know that, um, talked to Louisiana about that situation and they've got a number of capital facilities in Louisiana so they're they're almost treating it as sort of this is a Mississippi thing sort of a uh, just a you know unknown occurrence of why it occurred there so they're still focusing on their captive facilities in Louisiana uh, I'm not familiar with with Mississippi and you know, talking to their chief uh, Rush Walsh last year he just he says he, it's a mystery to them where this deer might have come from so they're just not really sure right now All right. Good deal. Any other questions? Thank you. Thanks for the briefing. Uh, I appreciate that. The uh, my concern, I guess, is the consumption of the the deer. I've been reading some articles, and it seems like uh, the uh, jury's out on whether it can be transmitted to, to humans or not. And I, I wonder if you've got any new information on that particular part of it or a plan, some part of your plan that addresses that potential. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, right now, there's no known human health implications to CWD. And people are still hunting in areas where CWD occurs and, and, um, and you know, harvesting deer. They've been doing it for decades in Colorado. Um, but uh, states and the Centers for De Disease Control have come out with some recent guidelines that said if you're hunting in a CWD area, endemic area, and you harvest a deer, you ought to get <clears throat> the animal tested before you consume any of the meat to make sure that it does not have CWD. And they also have guidelines in terms of handle, how to handle that deer in terms of field dressing, um, uh, you know, deboning it and all that kind of thing. So there are some guidelines out there for that. That's something that we would include in our information as well. Okay, and additionally, have they uh, been able to increase the speed at which the CWD test can be, be accomplished? Yeah, it's about, uh, right now, the states that are doing that, uh, they've got about a one to two week turnaround on that. Um, so once they get a test and sample in there, they're able to test it pretty quickly. Thank you. All right, Kent. I got a question for the chairman. Can we go jump in the pool? It's a flat hundred in here. 
Yes. It is hot. Let's do that. <laughs> Thank you, Greg, very much. Thank you. Uh, we're going to take a 15-minute uh, break uh, between now and the next presentation. So everybody, please be back in here at 255.